climate. Good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon to all our, uh, uh, to our audience from all parts of the world. Um, it's an absolute privilege uh, for us to have all of you at uh, today's webinar. Uh, I'm Yamini Ayer and I'm a member of, a commission member of the Lancet Commission on Reimagining Health, um, which is uh, uh, on India, uh, which is currently uh, the, the, the sort of uh, umbrella under which uh, today's uh, discussion is is taking place. Uh, it's uh, I uh, specifically uh, co-chair the governance work stream of the Lancet Commission, uh, and it's an absolute privilege for us to be able to host this really crucial conversation. Uh, some months ago, when uh, I first started a conversation with Vivek Devan at Sea Help, uh, he sort of reminded me that we've been you've been talking about universal health coverage, but there is an understanding underlying foundation to how to, to the frameworks of our debates on health, and that's the foundation of rights. And absent um, bringing that foundation front and center into our debates and, and discussions on what it means to imagine a health system, we may well be talking about a health system that isn't anchored in core rights um, and, and doesn't effectively shape the di uh, or respond to the complexities of the dynamics between citizens and the public health system uh, between citizens and their their own their rights uh, uh, in the context of health. Uh, and it is in that spirit that we felt it was extremely important for us to have a dialogue on why debates on universal health care uh, or health coverage uh, need to intersect with the dialogues and discourse on rights. Uh, in India specifically, uh, the courts have played a very, very important role uh, in uh, determining the contours of how policy uh, engages with health, the limits and aspirations of what India's public health system should be about and how it engages with citizens. Um, and therefore, it is even more important for us to bring the discourse on rights front and center into the discourse on policy and healthcare. So it's in that spirit that we requested Sea Help Vivek and Shubhangi here to organize today's discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for. Uh, for doing this and I will looking forward to learning from you. And thank you very, very much to our extremely uh, 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 esteemed uh, group of panelists. It's a real privilege for us at the Lancet Commission to be able to host all of you and learn from you. And I hope that uh, not only through the course of today's conversation, but uh, the, over the course of the commission's work itself that we get the opportunity to engage more with you uh, and bring to the table some of the ideas ideas uh, that all of you have pushed us to think about. So thank you and over to you, Vivek and, um, uh, and Shivangi to take us forward. Shivangi, sorry, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you, Yamini, for setting the context of this webinar. We are fortunate to have with us today an exciting array of eminent speakers. A lot can be said about each of the panelists who are all stalwarts in the fields, but I'm going to keep the introductions short as we have a tight schedule. Their longer bios are posted in the chat box for the benefit of our audience. So we have with us, Mr. Dania Spuras. He's a professor of child and adolescent psychiatry and public mental health at Vilnius University, Lithuania. He's also a former UN Special Rapporteur on the right to physical and mental health 2014 to 2020. Dr. Geeta Sen, Director and Distinguished Professor, Ramalinga Swami Center on Equity and Social Determinants of Health, PHFI, Bangalore. She was also a member of the high-level expert group, which recommended a roadmap for UHC in India in 2011. 
Vivek Devan, coordinator at Sea Health, ILS Law College, Pune, and a lawyer who has worked on the intersections of law, health, and rights for over two decades. And finally, Meera Sangamitra, an independent human rights activist. She has been associated with National Alliance for People's Movements for over a decade and has worked on several social justice issues, including women's rights and transgender movements. Before we hear from our panelists, a couple of logistical announcements. Each panelist will have 12 minutes to speak. Pooja will alert you at around 10 minutes for you to start winding up your talk. The audience members can post questions addressed to specific panelists in the Q&A box, which will be taken up in the last session, but please do keep them short. Uh, so let's dive straight in. Uh, I first invite Professor Puras to talk about the interlinkages between right to health and UHC as informed by international human rights law obligations. Thank you. It is a great pleasure for me to be part of this very meaningful event. I will share my experience um, after serving for last six years as a UN Special Rapporteur on the right to physical and mental health. As we know, the process of pursuing the transition to universal health coverage is not easy. And one of important issues is to identify all challenges and pitfalls awaiting stakeholders on this way. So the good news is this uh, global powerful consensus on the need uh, why universal health, uh, universal health coverage. Now we need to speak about uh, how, how to do this and what could be obligatory safeguards ensuring the success of this process and eliminating the risks of uh, failures. As we know, universal health coverage is a key dimension of the 2030 agenda commitment over achieving healthy lives and well being for all at all ages. And goal three includes an explicit commitment to achieve universal health coverage, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential, essential healthcare services, and access to safe, safe effective quality and affordable essential medicines and vaccines. Also to ensure access to sexual and uh, reproductive health care services, including family through for family planning, information and education. So th these are well-known targets, three, eight and three, um, seven. I, these are important targets. However, this is all not enough. Uh, because these studies do not make explicit commitments to confer priority to the poor and marginalized, either when coverage is expanded or uh, when services, which services should be provided when there is discussion about services. Now with pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, we is, have new challenges, as you all know, um, about prioritizing and uh, uh, I am uh, just want to highlight that without human rights based approach, uh, there is always a risk that universal health coverage efforts may entrench inequality. So prioritization and participation of the world's most uh, vulnerable is vital to both defining and achieving equitable uh, universal health coverage. This is also consistent with or obligations and the right to health to guarantee access to health services without discrimination and to take deliberate and targeted and concrete steps to ensure progressive realization of the right to health. Just moving to some examples, the right to health recognizes the importance of prioritizing uh, investments in primary and preventive care, and I should say social medicine, which benefits a far longer sector of population over expensive specialized services and investing in primary health care prevents illnesses, promotes physical and mental health, and in turn redu reduces the need for specialized care. Health-related policies, as we know, the implementation of good ideas has always been complicated. Although universal health coverage looks like 
like a simple idea based on common sense and the need for basic healthcare to reach everyone, it is important to issue a warning against any simplified way of addressing the universal health co coverage and the process of, of reaching it. Actually, all elements of the right to health analytical framework developed um, by my predecessors, uh, first and second special rapporteurs, Paul Hunt and Anand Grover, need to be taken very seriously in this regard. If any of these elements are for some reasons ignored or not ad adequately addressed, the process of reaching universal health co co coverage may be wrong. Let me just mention some examples which may illustrate the complexity of the goal ahead. First, accountability and transparency need to be seriously addressed. Healthcare systems remain seriously affected globally uh, in many countries and this alarming tendency uh, affected by corruption globally. And this alarming tendency needs to be abandoned in the process of reaching SDGs and universal health coverage. More specifically, meaningful involvement of citizens through partnerships between governments and civil society organizations could be a very good remedy to substantially promote transparency and accountability. And very often NGOs can do not only advocacy, they can be very good and effective service providers. While there are many important managerial and economic questions to be addressed in the process of reaching the universal health coverage, I would like to highlight other important issues which should not be ignored by policymakers. These are principles of non-discrimination, accountability, participation, and empowerment, also informed consent, and the need to go beyond narrow biomedical model so that holistic, equitable, and ethical care is provided to everyone, and especially to those belonging to vulnerable and disadvantaged groups. Selective approach to human rights is too often used by many states to achieve short-term goals, to, um, to pick low-hanging fruits, uh, including the one aimed at improving health indicators. This has led to serious imbalances and power asymmetries in health-related policies and services when some rights and needs have been promoted and protected at the expense of other ones. It is important to identify such imbalances and properly, properly address them. For example, focusing mainly on the access to essential medicines and vaccines, which is, we know, very important, especially now with COVID, as the huge importance of the accessibility so well recognized, but this still would be too narrow approach for reaching SDGs and universal health coverage. For example, investments in child health need to prioritize the right to health and holistic development, which is as important as the right to survival. Universal health coverage needs to include sexual and reproductive health rights, especially if we wish to empower children and adolescents for health and responsible adulthood and parenthood. Promotion of health and healthy development, as well as protection from all forms of violence in childhood and in later stage of life, includes many essential public health, social, and psychosocial interventions. Yes, they are of non-biomedical nature, and, but they should not be seen as some kind of luxury when considering what should be covered by universal health coverage. Furthermore, sustainable development goals and universal health coverage cannot be reached if drug policies remain punitive as they are now very often, or if palliative care is not available. SDGs and universal health coverage breached if mental health needs of everyone are uh, not taken as seriously as physical health needs. And if mental health policies and services do not abandon their reliance on institutionalization, excessive radicalization, paternalism, and the tendency of too offering coercion in the name of medicine. So these and other challenges can only be effectively addressed if all elements and principles of the right to health framework are mainstreamed in health policy formulation and, and implementation. So to, formulate, to formulate is often easier, to implement is more difficult, more, 
more pitfalls and challenges. And this is why we should always include non-discrimination, equality, participation, and accountability. Uh, just two words about the uh, private sector. Private sector should not be demonized. Private sector should be involved in national health systems so that it holds uh, hold, to hold it accountable. And then private sector can and, and must uh, um, contribute effectively to realization of the right to health, including in uh, reaching uh, universal health coverage. So um, we come back to the core of what the right to health is about and to be understanding, to the understanding that it is an indivis indivisible part of universal human rights. Uh, I mean, to health in, is indivisible part of universal human rights. As we all have now in moving towards SDGs and universal health coverage, we need to take on board the words of you know, famous HIV AIDS activist, Jonathan Mann, who told that the human rights framework provides a more useful approach for analyzing and responding to modern public health challenges than any framework thus far available within biomedical tradition. And what has been achieved globally in addressing HIV AIDS needs now to be replicated with the same level of global commitment and passion for all remaining global health concerns, such as addressing social determinants of health, burden of non-communicable, but also communicable diseases, diseases of poverty, mental health challenges, and many other global health issues. So uh, any departure from universal human rights principles and modern public health approach would be detrimental for the uh, success of this uh, process, I mean, of reaching the um, universal health cover coverage. So this, these were main uh, things which I wanted to highlight. This is uh, my, my uh, main impressions from working on thematic reports, but especially on, on um, visiting, visiting countries with official and other visits in all, all the regions. We have regional specifics, but most important are global uh, principles, especially human rights based approach. Thank you. Shivangi, you're on mute, Shivangi. Sorry. Thank you, Professor Puras. You made it amply clear that the UN General Assembly and World Health Assembly resolutions have consistently reiterated that the right to health is the overarching framework for UHC, which must follow that states should act in conformity with their obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill the right to health when designing and implementing UHC. Well, with that, I now invite Professor Geeta Sen to share her perspectives on social determinants of health and UHC from a gender lens. Thanks very much, um, Shivangi. I am, um, before I share my screen, I just want to say one, a couple of things. One is just to reiterate something that Dr. Puras mentioned which is that without a rights-based approach, UHC may actually end up reinforcing inequality. And I think we have the particular challenge here that because that famous UHC cube that WHO put out many, many years ago tells you where you, we should be going but doesn't tell us how, it can often be done in a way that where um, states actually find it convenient to pick the lowest hanging fruit. And if they do that, then in fact, those who are the most marginalized and the most at risk of not having rights to health will be the ones who get pushed further and further behind. And we have many examples of that. This is not something I plan to discuss myself in this talk. Um, let me um, share my screen and um, run you through this. 
Um, I've said from lip service to realizing the right to health. And I hope to show you in a minute why I'm calling it this. So the core concerns on women and gender equity in health for a long time has been, can be broadly seen to be threefold. First, over-focused by public programs on women as childbearers, receptacles for babies, fetuses, uh, breast milk, you name it. Um, the need to address these, but also to go beyond reproductive health and to include a life course approach. Secondly, to recognize women as rights holders with corresponding duty bearers so that we can start parsing exactly what does the right to health really mean for girls and women. And thirdly, the need to go beyond gender equality as a platitude, which it has become in too many places and cases to which lip service is paid, how to move to real changes on the ground. And I hope to say a few things about each of those. So lessons from my own prior involvement on these sets of questions come, I draw from two places. One, the Women and Gender Equity Knowledge Network that I co-chaired for the WHO's Commission on Social Determinants of Health. That experience was fascinating because it was at a time in the 2000s when in fact gender equity in health had not been sufficiently acknowledged and recognized, or if it was, it was seen as something secondary to um, economic inequality, poverty, household-based inequalities, and so on and so forth. And my experience, to put it bluntly and uh, quickly, with working with that um, knowledge network for that commission, is that although that network had over 60 people, core members participating in the network, in the end, when the report of the commission overall came out, it didn't really pay very much attention to all of the very hard work that had gone into the workings of that commission. Hence, my concerns about lip, lip service. Secondly, the Planning Commission's high-level expert group, and I hope to say a little bit more about this going forward. But broadly, what I've understood is that there's many ways in which one can miss the policy bus um, or end up reinventing the wheel over and over and over and over again, saying the same things in different words to different audiences, um, but really not making too much headway. So the HLEG itself had a bunch of um, recommendations when it came to gender. Um, broadly, these were improving access, Secondly, recognizing women's role as health providers. Thirdly, strengthening data analysis and monitoring and evaluation. And fourthly, to support and promote the rights of girls and women to health in families and communities and programs and policies. And then on each of these, there were detailed recommendations which I won't go to. Broadly, I would still say that the HLEG in terms of these recommendations was not too far off. Although, you know, 10 years plus on, one might, uh, yeah, one might you know, nuance, the modify and so on, what it was, those recommendations considerably. Where do I think we, in a sense, may have missed the bus or uh, be, um, fated to reinventing the wheel. I think it is that one fundamental question is being um, skirted, we go round and round it without naming it clearly. And I believe now that when we talk about rights-based approaches, we need to name that. What is that? Power. We don't talk enough about power, we don't talk about the role of power, neither at the policy level, nor at the level of programs, nor at the level of communities on the ground, enough 
so that we can actually not keep having to reinvent the wheel. Let me say a bit more about what I mean by this. Why focus on power? Because power often derives from exactly those deep structural inequalities that are not easy to change. Hardy perennials in this country, gender, caste, and others being added to, to those like religion, uh, but uh, which haven't been such a perennial over, um, over a millennia like gender and caste have been. Secondly, power, as we know, seeps into norms and beliefs, into what we know as truth and what we believe about the world and our role uh, within it. And thirdly, power, gender power exists at multiple levels that reinforce each other from the household right up to legislatures, executives, judiciaries, um, and so on. Um, and these are the reasons why we actually need to name and address power explicitly and not allow it to continue to hide in the crevices um, and of the UHC discussion. Gender power on, and health. Our health depends not only on our sex, but also on gender power systems and hierarchies. Gender power shapes which and whose health needs are recognized and prioritized, who gets access to resources and services, what quality those are, and who works at which level of the hierarchy of health workers versus frontline specialists versus frontline workers versus unpaid healthcare workers at home. In the work of the Knowledge Network for the WHO Commission, we had actually come up with what I believe is a relatively simple framework, which now in the context of our work on COVID-19, we have adapted and modified a bit 10 years later on. I won't go into all of this, but simply say that it has two causal blocks and then one is the consequences below. Structural causes, which include those larger economic political processes interacting with the forms of social, gender, and other forms of stratification and subordination, those long-standing inequalities. Secondly, and this is the most crucial for us here, intermediary health factors, which I believe operate at four levels, which we need to bear in mind. First, discriminatory values, norms, practices, and behaviors. Secondly, differential exposures, vulnerabilities to disease, disability, etc. These could be biosocial or they could be sex, gender, factors. Thirdly, continuing biases in health systems and policies. And fourthly, reinforcing those biases in health research. All of these four intermediary factors interact with each other, reinforce each other, sometimes but rarely counteract each other. And we need to pay attention to the way in which all of these work if we are really not to keep having to reinvent the wheel. So we need what in recent work we've called power-focused realist evaluations. And there are four sets of questions in any context that are essential. They are necessary, but not sufficient to the particular context. First, dimensions and sources of power. In any health context, access to resources, knowledge, control over decisions in any health context, including service provision. Secondly, how power is built into what we call the artifacts of a program strategy. How is power built into a program's objectives, into its rules, into the, its procedures, into its financing methods? These are things we don't sufficiently go into. And it often is the reason why lip service to grand notions of equity, equality, universality, gender justice, and so on, stated at the level of principles, get sabotaged under the subterfuge of the 
nitty gritty of program strategies. And we need to look at how power is built into these. Thirdly, what does this mean for the incentives, disincentives and behaviors that result in terms of health providers, in terms of health seekers, in terms of people within households and families, and what are the consequences thereof for policy and program outcomes? Let me give one quick example, if I still have the time, and that is um, just an illustration what this means in the context, let's say, of the quality of institution deliveries in India. We all know that the numbers of institution deliveries, thanks to NRHM, have gone up dramatically. We also know that questions about what is actually going down in the name of institutional deliveries is open to question. Still, in my, in my own mind, there's absolutely no question but these have played a role in reducing the numbers of maternal deaths. But what about quality? Um, and we have the luxury program of the government today, which claims to be moving towards improving quality. And yet a good look at luxury tells us that it remains focused as most government programs tend to do on the bricks and mortar building better health centers, ensuring that there may be a toilet um, and so on, but not to the software of power where power is embedded. So we need to ask the following kinds of questions. What women confront in public, overcrowding, routine verbal abuse, lack of cleanliness or privacy, routine episiotomies, pushing on the abdomen to hasten delivery. And I'm naming only a few, and I'm saying this on the basis of tangible research that my team and I have done. So this is what women confront in public services, despite all of the language of improving quality, versus on the other side, the private sector, highly doubtful quality, lack of accountability, over-focus on C-sections and hysterectomies. Secondly, what does it mean? WHO guidelines, and they exist. There's excellent WHO guidelines, and there are very good domestic guidelines as well that follow from these, are often observed in the breach. When we did our field work, the head of department at teaching hospitals would tell us, oh yes, we absolutely follow the guidelines. The reality is in the labor wards, and in fact, very openly, the people who are actually doing the deliveries in the labor wards, the interns, the postgraduate um, researchers who are actually the ones providing um, services in the labor wards will tell you, well, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, do you allow or do you promote pushing on a woman's abdomen, which is an absolute no, according to the guidelines? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. So the reality versus what everybody at another level is claiming is what gets done. Thirdly, how can a power analysis help? Start with what a poor Dalit or Muslim woman confronts when she goes in for an institutional delivery. Then move to why she confronts it and then to how to change it. I don't have time to go into this in greater detail, but I wanted to illustrate to you that in fact, if we have to move from the level of repeating ourselves and lip service to actually making concrete changes happen. We need focus very centrally, not just on power as an abstract category, but power relations as they in fact adhere and are embedded in health systems. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seth. The conceptual push to understand power and its role in thinking about UHC programs that you've highlighted is probably one of the most crucial 
key questions facing not just law and policy makers but civil society as well this this though leads us in an interesting way to vivek's presentation as we often consider laws and jurisprudence as a way to deal with some of the questions you have posed on power vivek thanks shivangi um i think yes indeed my uh, presentation will focus on i think the law largely and the ways in which uh, the courts have really uh, engaged on issues of health uh, but and i must say that uh, when uh, dr sen uh, spoke about power focused realist evaluations it made me think about really immediately uh, how um, you know as the discipline of law we really rarely uh, kind of go into that kind of a granular granular analysis of some of some of these social justice issues uh the courts uh, ultimately are places where general solutions are offered uh, orders are issued directions are issued but the granular understanding of how power plays out for instance in communities is very rarely does the court get the opportunity to really delve deep into uh so i think um what the law can do then is really support uh uhc and 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 show a uh, ways in which and probably hint towards how uh, rights based approaches and the right to health can be a one, a one you know a framework which supports the larger kind of program uh but i will uh, i will uh, really focus on um largely on how the courts have stepped in in the context of health rights generally and the right to health in particular uh, and give a broad description of that uh in my 10 to 12 minutes um and then i'd like to talk a little bit about how statutory law plays or does not play a role um and in doing so also hark uh, at uh, you know speak towards to to the some of the points which uh, the high level expert group uh, on universal health coverage which dr sen was part of uh, has actually raised certain critical aspects of and where the law seems possibly not to tackle um, some of those aspects very well and where some of that needs to be addressed so let me start of course with the constitution where it really all begins uh, i think uh, the audience probably is not uh, an audience of lawyers entirely and so i'll i'll kind of um, you know spend a little time just explaining very very briefly what that little that architecture is um, and that architecture really emerges from article 21 in part 3 of uh, the constitution uh, uh which guarantees that no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to procedure established by law uh so this is really the the fountainhead from which uh we when we talk about the right to life a lot of the other rights have emerged um and the supreme court has read not just the supreme court but other constitutional courts in india have read the has read the fundamental right to health into article 21 um and it has done so by also looking at two other articles in our constitution so article 21 which forms part of our fundamental rights which is really the core of our uh, of 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 our legal framework and then there is um, another portion of the constitution which refers to directive principles of state policy which is really guidance that is offered by the constitution about how government should be actually implementing policy and the guiding principles by which uh, policy should be devised uh and so um uh, the 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 court has looked at both article 21 and a couple of these other articles one of them is article 39e which is uh requires the states to ensure uh, that health and strength of workers men and women and the tender age of children are not abused and article 47 which says that the state shall regard the raising of the level of nutrition and standards of living and the improvement of public health is among its primary duties so you know this is where really um uh, the thrust of uh you know any attempt to try and give shape to uh, health based rights has really come from uh from within uh, the citizenry within um, civil society etc and it has been the constant kind of approach to the judiciary which has fine tuned and articulated this understanding of what the right to health may or may not contain and so i think in 2021 today we have a much more a better sense of what that these contents uh, are although it is even though it is not really expressed in very clear terms in a statute or in very clear terms in a section of the law uh, one of the earliest articulations of how article 21 is relevant in relation to a health issue emerged in a case 
uh, where the Supreme Court said that the right to life uh, foists an obligation on not just the state, but also the private sector to save life in emergency situations. So this was a case where someone was denied emergency health services and succumbed. And the court said that um, there's no question uh, that, uh, that, that access to such services is absolutely vital to preserve the right to life, which is explicitly stated in Article 21. And therefore, emergency care became something that had to be actually something which was uh, incumbent on both the state and the private sector to protect. So this was an interesting thing, and I emphasize private sector here because I will come hopefully to how um, uh, you know that is not necessarily been the focus of the courts since this early ruling in 1989. Um, so such an interpretive, uh, such interpretation has been really used to expand the meaning of Article 21, like I just said, which is the right to life, uh, to include all kinds of other things, everything from human dignity to essential freedoms and entitlements like clean water, food security, healthcare, of course, which we'll go into a little more deeply, sanitation, housing, livelihoods. So all of this really now encompasses the right to life and liberty. And uh, so, you know, um, when, when those of us who work on these issues actually claim rights uh, constitutionally, we frame them within Article 21 and where, uh, where the understanding of health rights has been fleshed out even more. So uh, there are various aspects uh, to the right to health. Uh, I think they are way too much to cover in the little, limited time one has, but I wanted to highlight a few judgments which are relevant in the context of particularly universal health coverage. I think there are aspects of these judgments which will resonate uh, when we're thinking of universal health coverage and its contents and what really UHC should comprise of. One of those aspects is, for instance, the issue of the access to medicines, uh, access to just medicines to, 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 to obtain better health. Um, it's an issue that courts have actually grappled with and recognized and acted on to ensure the fulfillment of the right to health. So, for instance, in 2017, there was a case where the Delhi High Court declared that access to life-saving medicines for rare diseases is inherent to the right to life as a component of the right to health under Article 21. And by ruling as such, it directed the state government to take steps to provide access to affordable medicines and treatment in the case of Devi Devanan, uh, which, uh, you know, of course, has been actually, uh, has been, has been uh, discussed and is, uh, is, uh, is an important articulation of how um, treatment, uh, treatment access is fundamental to the right to life. Similarly, actually, the court, uh, the same court, the Delhi High Court, also uh, uh, conducted what was what is known as a uh, as a continuing mandamus hearing, which is where it actually supervised the implementation, the mandatory implementation of its orders over time, to monitor the finalization of the national policy for rare diseases by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. And the court did so because it wanted to oversee that its directions were actually being uh, followed and implemented. So there also you had a case where part of the national policy for rare diseases was about around access to treatment in that context. Um, similarly, in more broader context, courts have said a lot on access to uh, treatment and healthcare. Uh, in the famous, more famous case of National Legal Service Authority versus Union of India, NALSA as it's known, uh, where the court established the equality of transgender persons, it also said that transgender persons have access to HIV-related healthcare services, mental health care services, and public health facilities and sanitation services. So although it did not frame it as a right to health issue, it clearly was giving meaning to uh, the constitutional rights of transgender persons by referring to uh, specific health areas. Um, it also has, and this is an area which I think is of, uh, has, has come to the fore in the context of COVID-19, certainly, uh, around the issue of occupational health and safety of workers. Uh, and of course, in the case of COVID-19, frontline healthcare workers, uh, where the Supreme Court has directed, not in the context of COVID, of course, but earlier, uh, has directed employers to undertake appropriate measures for occupational health and safety of workers, and ordered them to provide free medical consultations and treatment until cured or for lifetime for occupational diseases. Now, uh, again, this is largely in the context of government employment. Uh, and I again want to emphasize that because I think Dr. Puras mentioned the private sector. 
And I think the private sector is one big area through which healthcare is delivered, which is not necessarily very clearly governed by uh, legal frameworks, especially around right to health issues. Um, then there are other issues of access apart from medicines, which the courts have said some really important things around. Uh, in again, in 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 relevant to UHC is the issue of the right to access health insurance as part of the right to health. Uh, this came up in the case of genetic conditions in Jay Prakash Tayal's case, or mental health conditions in another case, Shikha Nishal's case. So you have the right to access health insurance, uh, which cannot be denied just because you have a specific gen genetic condition, which is exclusionary. Uh, where, where the policy is exclusionary, or if you have a mental health condition where a policy is exclusionary. Similarly, uh, in quite a few cases around right to sexual and reproductive health, the courts have said that uh, sexual reproductive health rights are integral to the right to health. Uh, in one particular case around unsanitary and unethical sterilization procedures against um, on women. Um, then the courts have talked also and gone into, you know, really policy issues are not necessarily their domain, but have had to kind of intervene. And this is in the context of deployment of human resources for health. So for instance, reservation and recruitment, recruitment of healthcare workers from rural communities as an effective policy to fulfill right to health obligations towards rural communities by ensuring that there's medical staff available and uh, there is a facilitation of access to healthcare goods and services in, 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 in places where otherwise access is challenging. Um, so that's an interesting intervention by the court where it has actually stepped in and said the state needs to reallocate its resources in terms of how it designs policy to ensure that competent health cadres are available in, in rural contexts. And again, very relevant in the context of universal health coverage. There's one whole other area which I will touch on uh, very briefly. I, I already see that I'm running out of time. Uh, which is the area of social determinants of health. I think uh, Dr. Sen spoke about this uh, and certainly referred to uh, the context of gender quite clearly, uh, but there are issues around social determinants of health uh, that have made the link between larger factors at play that affect the right to health. So for instance, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples where the Bombay High Court has recognized that the right to health includes underlying determinants of health like access to public toilets and sanitation facilities. And it has done so particularly uh, to ensure that special measures are made to facilitate women's access to public toilets and sanitation facilities because it hinders the ability of a city and its citizens to really enjoy rights fully. Uh, the Supreme Court has held that the right to food is an integral uh, component of the right to health under Article 21 uh, and therefore uh, now looking more broadly as health being uh, informed by all these other social determinants. So that's a really important direction in which the court has gone in, uh, in kind of not necessarily framing it as a right to health issue, but uh, uh, use, uh, you know, uh, certainly making the links with the right to life. And, and I think uh, as health activists and people who uh, advocate the right to health, these are important kind of, uh, you know, pointers towards how, um, uh, uh, right to health can be more fully realized. Um, so this is uh, some of the stuff that I thought uh, is important to highlight in the, my limited time. I should say two or three more things though. Shivangi, I hope I have a couple of minutes more. One is that I think uh, while the court has looked at the constitution, it has also looked at the international covenant on economic, social, cultural rights. And it, and it, it is that international covenant which India is signatory to. And it is that international covenant which actually very clearly articulates the right to health as a fundamental human right. Um, and it's, it's, the courts have often leaned on that to actually give a fuller understanding to what the right to health really comprises of. And um, Dr. Puras mentioned this briefly also, but there are certain elements which have been infused in that right under the international covenant. Um, and uh, those are the ones which really the courts have gone more deeply into in analyzing some of the social determinants uh, uh, which are linked to the right to health. Um, there is of course COVID of the last 18 months and we have seen the courts being getting more and more active uh, in many cases. Uh, for instance, the Bombay High Court has found gross negligence by a government hospital where a partially decomposed body was found uh, of a person who had died of COVID. 
and the uh, the, the, the 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 courts uh, said that actually there's a right to health which is mandated under article 21 and timely medical treatment is part of that right to health similarly uh, courts have said madras high court has said that persons with disabilities should be given priority in vaccination and vaccination centers must be made accessible as part of the right to health of people who are disabled uh, again uh, and a really important component, I think, which gets lost often in conversations on UHC2, but also in the context of delivering fully on the right to health is the issue of right to information. Uh, where the Patna High Court has directed the state government to provide online information to public on the number of deaths that have taken place due to COVID as part of actually their fundamental right to information, very closely linked to the right to health. Um, capping of fees of charges by private hospitals is another uh, point on which courts have intervened and actually capped fees, which was a really telling moment in, in the last 18 months around uh, uh, where the right to health trumped uh, other kind of um, issues and prior so-called priorities. Um, and, and so that this gives uh, hopefully uh, a kind of a, a overall view of where uh, uh, the courts have come in. And it's, it's largely been the courts which have come in. But I'd like to touch on one more thing before I close, which is that there is also statutory law. So we have the Constitution of India, but we have a few statutory laws which have actually enabled the right to health uh, in a much more meaningful way. There are many uh, of late, particularly there's the Disabilities Act, there's the Mental Health Care Act, there is uh, the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence, and there's the Transgender Persons Act. But I just want to focus on the HIV Act, and I want to do so largely because there are some aspects which the high level expert group on universal health coverage uh, has noted that are of great relevance in relation to delivering on a robust right to health uh, and UHC. Um, and I think the judicial action on these areas has been rather limited. And I wanted to highlight these three or four because I think statutory law in particular, for instance, the HIV Act tries to address this. Uh, I think uh, the courts have, like I've described, looked at various issues and said, well, this is part of the right to health or that is a health right. But uh, the how-to of delivering on the right to health uh, has received less attention uh, from the court. And so uh, four issues um, have come up in the context of the HIV Act. One is on governance of the private sector. It's the first law followed closely by the Mental Health Care Act where the private sector was included within an anti-discrimination framework. So the private sector had, became accountable for the manner in which it was delivering healthcare in the context of HIV. I think that's a really important issue that the high level expert group talks about. The other is citizen participation, which I think uh, Dr. Puras mentioned around accountability and transparency and involvement of citizens. Uh, there are ways in which that has been attempted through the HIV Act, which could be a model and suggest ways forward for, um, uh, for uh, you know, a UHC which has these components, which are inherent to a delivery of the right to health. The third is the issue of grievance, grievance redress. The grievance redress has to be effective and localized. There is no point in trying to provide a right where justice is almost inaccessible because access to justice is as much of a right as anything else. And so trying to create simple mechanisms for grievance redress, if, for instance, universal health coverage is not accessible to someone. And finally, and I think the courts have tried to do, do this a bit, and certainly Dr. Sen and Dr. Puras both spoke about this, is focusing on the needs of the marginalized. I think the HIV Act very much is focused on that. And again, uh, I think uh, these are the three or four groundings which I think are essential apart from uh, in terms of the how-tos uh, uh, for a right to health really to have some effect in the context of legal frameworks and universal health coverage. Thanks. Thank you, Vivek. Your talk really sets out quite well that the right to health is in fact a core constitutional right and has been interpreted by the Indian courts expansively in accordance with the right to health framework in international law that you talked about and also what uh, Professor Puras had mentioned. Um, and that courts will step in when the right is violated and give directions to expand public health programs. This makes it all the more important then that any UHC program or framework be examined from a right to health lens too. With that, I finally invite uh, Meera Sangamitra 
Her talk will be on providing meaning to rights-based approaches to UHC from marginalized contexts. Meera. Thank you, Shivangi, Yamini, and uh, Vivek, of course, and all the uh, co-panelists. Uh, uh, I've been very keenly listening to all of your presentations, and a lot of things, in fact, resonate when we, uh, as part of campaigns for a universal access to healthcare, uh, articulate and speak of. And I think what Dr. Sain, uh, she literally hit the nail on the head when she spoke of the whole notion of power and why it needs to be center stage in understanding a lot of the dynamics and politics around access or the denial to healthcare. Uh, so with that context, I would want to start off very briefly uh, with an observation that in 2021, we are exactly three decades since the whole uh, regime of privatization and liberalization was uh, set off in uh, India. And uh, it's important, I think, to really acknowledge as to, uh, because when we talk of universalization of healthcare or uh, other uh, uh, intensifying access to public uh, health and other services in the public uh, sector. Uh, it's important to also look at how the architecture that existed for the last three years or the policy measures that were followed, uh, in fact, uh, to a large extent contributed to uh, dilution of access to uh, dilution of uh, access to all these services, to these rights, basically to these entitlements and denial uh, structural denial over uh, decades. And uh, it is therefore important to state very emphatically that uh, the regime of privatization has not worked and it has in fact been counterproductive at the end of, if one really reviews this uh, uh, entire policy framework at the end of three decades, it's very, very clear that whether in the context of healthcare, whether in the context of uh, education, whether in, the, in other contexts, it is very uh, amply clear that privatization and liberalization has, and COVID has in fact added, of course, a very thick layer of vulnerability further to all these uh, uh, marginalized communities. And when we speak of marginalized communities, these are not minorities, but actually the majority of our country, because when we speak of the broader Bahujan umbrella, it includes all the categories that uh, you know one really needs to speak of, 80% of Dalits, Adivasis, transgender persons, queer persons, uh, women across all categories, Muslims and other minorities, uh, Vimukta, NTD, NT uh, communities, uh, uh, persons, uh, not just political prisoners, but people who are uh, into prisons, because a lot of times those who are in prisons also and do not have access to healthcare over there also are from a lot of marginalized uh, communities. Uh, so on and so forth, or persons with disabilities, children, etc. So when we talk of healthcare, uh, am I audible? Shivangi? Yes, yes, absolutely. Ah, sorry. Uh, so when we speak of access to healthcare, it, it is something that, uh, uh, that matters to all these uh, categories of the population who form the bulk of our 80% uh, of our population. But when the policy is determined, or in fact, not just policies, even uh, uh, Vivek spoke extensively about the legal uh, frameworks and uh, the experiences with the judiciary as well. But I would say it has honestly been mixed. In some ways, yes, the rights regime has been reinforced, but in, uh, on certain occasions, it has also been, I mean, there's been a lot of oscillation between rights and rhetoric as well. So it's also important to, to note that, especially with the Supreme Court, maybe many times, I mean, uh, there has been a lot of hope often from the high courts and where we've had uh, certain good orders in specific contexts, and it has been possible to assert uh, some of these rights and connected with the frameworks of uh, healthcare uh, obligation of the states. Uh, but it has also been very, very challenging because uh, many times these get limited to very specific contexts and uh, uh, any attempt to kind of uh, use these progressive rulings to, to a broader context does not really yield much result. So there has also been that kind of experience that practitioners have uh, had on the ground. Uh, so having said that, I would want to specifically also a bit focus on uh, some of the marginalized communities that I referred to. Uh, one could begin with the trans uh, community uh, itself. Uh, it's true that yes, after, uh, I mean, almost 70 years, 75 years since the constitution in 2014, we had NALSA. NALSA did recognize uh, in some ways the 
the right to health services without discrimination, the right of the responsibility of the state to actually uh, guarantee many of these services to uh, transgender communities who are one of the most marginalized uh, sections of our population uh, to this day. And uh, we've seen, uh, and in fact, it's not just, I mean, COVID or no COVID, uh, certain structures of discrimination have always existed. Lack of access to uh, uh, public uh, healthcare structures has always existed for some of these communities. So it has, uh, I mean, even at the very level of entry, it is so difficult to actually access these services. Of course, I mean, there has been a lot of work and where there has been some amount of work or politicization or work within and with the communities, uh, one has been able to push uh, and hold local uh, health facilities and institutions accountable uh, to principles of non-discrimination. Uh, but if one looks at it in a broader uh, framework and in terms of the accountability of the state, uh, then you, I mean, all of these basic things, right? For instance, there are very specific uh, uh, requirements in addition to all the general requirements that trans people have as equal citizens, specific requirements around uh, psychosocial support. I mean, there's absolutely no mental health uh, support or there is no imagination of the need for any form of mental health support to, uh, to hormonal therapy, which is not seen as part of the, uh, uh, as a public health need for trans people to uh, gender reassignment uh, surgeries and other forms of interventions, so on and so forth. So there are also uh, very many specifics that uh, trans people require as part of uh, their our right to a life with uh, dignity and life of equality. But a lot of these things are still not part of, uh, I mean, despite now, yes, we do have the 2019 Act and the rules and all of that, but I mean, that's a longer conversation about, you know, it's one step forward, two steps uh, backward kind of uh, uh, experience we've had. But uh, even beyond that, uh, what, if, what is it that this does to uh, trans people on the ground in terms of access to healthcare services? Uh, we've, in fact, what we've also seen is uh, many times, very certain states, it's possible uh, to push certain things at the level of the state governments and uh, the state policy to, to maybe get something at a pan-Indian level might not always be uh, possible or not, not be even ideal for uh, the kind of diverse nation that we are. And uh, many times very specific uh, policy interventions that have happened. Uh, this is true also of other sectors, but I speak right now in the specific context of health uh, measures that say the Tamil Nadu government has taken, for instance, or the Kerala government has taken, although one would still wish more on those fronts as well. But uh, even those limited kinds of interventions have uh, not happened uh, beyond you know, some of these states. So, so there are all these uh, experiences that one uh, has in the context of uh, transgender people. But I think it's also important to locate uh, not just the questions and rights of trans persons, but also uh, the overall question of right to health within a political framework of the working class uh, population. Because, and the migrant workers uh, crisis is again a very uh, graphic example of uh, how the whole question of uh, lack of livelihoods, lack of livelihood security, lack of income security, uh, lack of social security is so deeply interlinked with the question of access to. Uh, uh, public health, right? So uh, we do, I mean, again, there are uh, laws since the Migrant Workers Act to the 2008 Social Security Act to now the Supreme Court having woken up very late during last year's pandemic and then having passed some orders, which again to a large extent uh, could not be implemented on the ground. So there's this whole uh, uh, experience as well one uh, has, right? So uh, within this context, if one looks at how uh, 93% of our working population, and within that I would definitely include transgender people as working class uh, communities and also all the other uh, sections of our population as well, not having access to uh, social security, starting from uh, not, I mean, on the one hand, we have a whole surveillance regime and uh, uh, data tracking and all, but on the other hand, the state still does not have uh, uh, a proper mechanism to actually uh, uh, identify people and based on that identification provide essential services to many of these uh, communities. For instance, we saw even in the context of the trans uh, population last year, the uh, 
the COVID relief, which was uh, given that to after a lot of, uh, I mean, push and uh, pursuit was just for 1% of the overall trans population in the country. And that uh, the estimate of the trans population was also of the 2000. Uh, 11 census, you know, much before the NALSA. So definitely, I mean, the population is much huger and even the, the bare minimum income support that went to one-time support that went to the trans population was only 1% of the entire uh, population in the country. So one can actually imagine that, I mean, the uh, uh, there is such a lack of imagination at the level of the uh, uh, central government uh, in particular, but governments in general as to how, how does one, in fact, identify uh, these populations that are so vulnerable and uh, neglected and why they would need specific forms of uh, support. For instance, many times we are still having to argue as to why a pension support is necessary. Some states like say Andhra Pradesh have uh, brought forth pension support, but in addition to healthcare, uh, uh, strengthening the healthcare system, it's also important to provide these forms of social security uh, support, which is still not available for a lot of uh, these uh, populations. Uh, so trans people, for instance, in Andhra Pradesh do have now for a couple of years uh, pension support. But again, there are a whole list of uh, conditions in that they say you have to uh, be below the poverty line as if I think trans people are above the poverty line. Most are below the poverty line. In fact, they say you have to mandatorily undergo the uh, SRS and only then you will have access to the pensions. They say you have to give up on begging and sex work as if uh, other livelihood options are readily being provided by the state. So these, all these conditions apply uh, frameworks that are uh, put in, make even the limited schemes less accessible to, uh, uh, to communities that are vulnerable. So this is just one example, case and example, but there are these kinds of uh, riders that governments put in as well with uh, you know, schemes that come in. So therefore it becomes all the more important that on the one hand, while we continue to argue for and push for uh, universalization of uh, uh, healthcare, which we think, and across movements, this is a demand that has uh, strengthened, especially in the past uh, few years, to, to look at how uh, lack of uh, healthcare in the, uh, lack of healthcare, lack of universalization of healthcare has actually uh, impacted some of these communities in very, very, uh, specific ways. For instance, just a couple of weeks back, we were having a meeting with some of the uh, nomadic uh, community uh, youth, and they were speaking of how lack of documentation within those communities actually meant that, I mean, they were access to, uh, to healthcare because of lack of documentation was becoming such a basic issue. So there are so many of these specifics that have not become part of the imagination of the uh, uh, policy regime, but what we are also seeing is very worryingly uh, with, I mean, despite these uh, 30 years of experience, negative experience with privatization at all, we are also seeing a further push for privatization with Ayushman Bharat and, I mean, the district hospital, the suggestion for district hospitals to be uh, a graded privatization. So all of these things, so where are we headed is definitely a cause of concern. With this government, honestly, the other cause of concern is also uh, I mean, of course, yes, one must uh, value and respect traditional uh, knowledge and traditional medical knowledge, but, but there is a thin line between valuing traditional knowledge and how oh, they're actually going on to the other side of, I mean, really pushing unscientific methods of uh, uh, healthcare and medical interventions. And what does that mean to our public healthcare system and especially for vulnerable populations is something that I think should be part of our uh, uh, agendas. Uh, and we should also equally talk about when we speak of uh, rights of workers, informal workers largely, uh, there was a reference to frontline workers. Many times there is a warriorization of the frontline workers, but uh, what actually happens is the, the everyday concerns of, I mean, every single day we are seeing the Asha workers or the Anganwadi workers organizing dharna in some part of the country. So on the one hand, there is an increasing feminization of all these frontline uh, workforce happening, the what we call infamously as the paraization, right? So you are the para teacher, the para healthcare worker. So all of these uh, World Bank models have been pushed and imposed and being institutionalized and being uh, celebrated as warriors. Whereas, I mean, the basic uh, uh, work security that needs to be uh, provided, uh, 
uh, to, to these constituencies is not there. And that then directly has an implication on the kinds of services that they're able to provide to a broader uh, uh, mass of people who are already uh, vulnerable because of other social uh, locations. So it's important maybe to connect when we speak of uh, access to public health care and universalization of public health to be able to connect many of these uh, realities on the ground as well and uh, frame our uh, not just asks but I mean one doesn't know who to ask with the current uh, regime but it's important to build a political narrative around why certain things have not worked so far so what needs to be the road ahead in terms of uh, framing a public uh, health uh, campaign and the need for nationalization of uh, uh, healthcare. When we talk of nationalization, we are again not talking of centralization. We are talking of the state being accountable for people's uh, healthcare, all all forms of healthcare. So I think it is with these caveats that we need to also uh, walk the path of uh, nationalization and the universalization uh, uh, demand. And uh, yeah, let's see how we actually. It's it's a difficult uh, struggle, and we are constantly. Uh, in many of the conversations across communities, and because of lack of time, I think I've already yeah, overshot my time. So I'm not referring to the specifics of, say, the displaced communities or migrant populations, the kinds of concerns that they have. I mean, the uh, the absolutely pathetic conditions in resettlement colonies of a lot of displaced uh, uh, communities. Uh, so I mean, there is there is a grand plan on paper, but when it comes to implementation. There is so little accountability and people are constantly being made to run from uh, pillar to post. So how do you actually uh, materialize some of these uh, things uh, which should have been there by now, but there is, you only see a further dilution of uh, many of these things with the privatization regime. So fighting that regime on the one hand and also asserting uh, existing rights. I mean, there was a lot of reference to uh, uh, fundamental rights and the directive principles. It's a it's a sad reflection of our 75 years of uh, political journey that uh, many of the directive principles still remain directive principles and are not entirely incorporated within the framework of uh, fundamental uh, rights. So that will continue to be an ongoing uh, uh, struggle uh, within the larger framework of uh, the fight that we are having against uh, the capital. Yeah, I'll stop. Thank you, Meera. That was really insightful. Your talk, in fact, uh, reiterates one of the criticisms of uh, UHC's narrow focus, which is on financial exclusion, is that it diverts attention from other forms of exclusion and marginalization experienced by several vulnerable groups. For example, on the basis of caste, religion, sex, gender, sexual orientation, HIV status, etc. There is clearly a need to draw attention to other social determinants of health and issues of discrimination and marginalization within the health system. And it'll be interesting going forward, we see what kind of frameworks of um, um, uh, accountability does the right to health afford and uh, can present to um, rights-based UHC. Um, but, um, I think the next session was supposed to be like me putting up questions to uh, each of the panelists, but I think we are running out of time. So we are moving straight to the questions posed by the audience. And uh, one of the questions is from um, Alok Arunam. And he asks that several sociologists like Professor Dipankar Gupta and Professor Andre Patel, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, had differentiated between equality as right and equality as policy. Mere rights-based approaches without sufficient attention to state capacity are not useful. Isn't then the emphasis on rights-based approach not pragmatic enough? I think that all of you can uh, respond to this uh, in terms, you can take a couple of minutes. So uh, should I first ask um, Dr. Uh, Professor Puras to respond to this? Uh, okay. I don't think that the uh, right uh, to health uh, concept or human rights based approach is not pragmatic. If it is applied in sustainable and consistent way it is it can be 
very pragmatic and the, the best example for me is how AIDS epidemic was was managed when when the message from from experts was uh, to stop discriminating key populations even those political leaders who maybe did not like this idea realized that that this is essential it's like remedy and uh, so uh, uh, the, there was another question uh, to me, I think, but it's, it's about the same. When, when we all are concerned about how to implement properly the, the let's say, well-formulated policies with the right to health and human rights-based approach present in, in formulation, I think it's very important about monitoring and independent monitoring on everything what is happening uh, on, on national policy level, on, on local, municipal service provision and on individual, uh, you know, when, when patient meets health staff, what's happening there. And this is about process and especially about outcomes and for independent monitoring, uh, again, transparency is needed. So. Uh, not only uh, academics are needed, but civil society is needed to observe, uh, to observe and to signal if something is is going wrong. And things are going wrong when or if uh, there is some imbalances, asymmetries, including uh, power asymmetries, gender-based, as it was in Gita's Sen presentation, or or based on asymmetries between. Uh, users and providers of services like it happens in mental health services when with good intentions users of mental health services are disempowered even if biomedical model may may be helpful but because of these power asymmetries which still exist people are disempowered and not not empowered so this would be my my comment Thank you, Professor Puras. Can I ask uh, Professor Sain to respond to this now, please? Um, <clears throat> I'll sort of, you know, reframe the question as whether right-based, a rights-based approach is pragmatic enough. It's as straightforward as that. Um, and of course, <laughs> I would not um, argue that it isn't. Uh, however, um, it is, one might argue that a legal approach may be necessary, but it may not be sufficient to realize the full implications of a rights-based approach. So the equation of rights-based approach with legal approaches seems to underlie this question. And I think that that's a problematic uh, equation. Uh, rights-based approaches are not only legal approaches. And I think that all, all of us have been trying to point to different ways in which uh, the meaning of the right to health can actually be uh, viewed from different stances, different positions, different perspectives, um, and also different disciplinary um, um, backgrounds. I would say, however, that are, um, secondly, that the challenge is not one primarily of state capacity. Um, it is actually the problem of power. Um, and one of the ways in which um, power in the context of UHC discussions lies hidden is the fact that UHC itself, in the way that it is often promoted, can become an obfuscation for the larger changes in social, economic, and other policies that Mira was speaking about and that I think um, uh, quite often are headed in the opposite direction 
to what realization of the right to health or of genuine universality of care for everyone would entail. And we have multiple examples of that. One very powerful example that was um, detailed quite a bit in uh, the former health secretary Sujata Rao's book, Do We Care? Is, was the problem of what happened to medical education in this country. In the name of moving toward having more um, uh, capacity in the um, in uh, training health health providers at all levels, the private sector was invited into uh, medical education. Um, Twenty years later, we still don't have enough health providers in the rural areas because of the way in which that has happened. So UHC quite often is promoted as a what in terms of here's the goal towards which we want to go while obfuscating the how. And the how of privatization, which has come along with the language of UHC quite often can be quite challenging. Now, let me say one thing, however, as a caveat to this. I'm not against the private sector per se. I think that there are problems with the public sector if it doesn't have good challengers coming from the other side. The public sector can be mean, vicious, poor quality, and unaccountable. And there's a problem of the private sector if it doesn't have a strong public sector pushing it in the other direction. One of the interesting things about the state of Kerala is that you have this kind of balancing battle constantly going on between the private health providers and the public um, health system. Um, anyone, and I've lived in Kerala for 10 years, so I can absolutely vouch for this. Anyone can tell you, purely left to itself, public health providers don't, especially medical colleges and others, don't really provide you with the quality of services that you might want. So it's good to have the private sector breathing down their necks a little bit. On the other hand, you cannot have in health the private sector run rampant um, and free to do what it likes without a strong public sector to push in the other direction. I do believe, therefore, directions such as the one that Mira mentioned, Niti Aayog's turning district hospitals into privatizing district hospitals is a recipe for disaster. District hospitals in many places significantly need to be improved. Their quality has to be improved and they need to be made accountable to the populations that they serve. But calling for accountability is not the same thing as simply privatizing them. Nor are the famous, or should I say infamous, public-private partnerships taken beyond a very limited frame. Yes, it makes sense to privatize laundry services to a hospital. Why should a hospital be providing, be doing its own laundry? Of course, it makes sense to get a decent laundry service provider for a hospital. However, that is not the same thing as bringing private, unaccountable private provision into what should be solidly publicly provided um, um, basis of care that anyone can access. And I think that balance is what we need to find for UHC to work right. So it's not a question of being pragmatic, not pragmatic, et cetera. We need to be pragmatic. We need to be reasonable. We need to use what we have, but we don't need to be driven by an ideology that somehow the private sector will solve all 
problems. As I said, in maternal health, you let the private sector run rampant and you will get huge rates of C-sections beyond anything that is the WHO norm. You will get huge rates of hysterectomies because hysterectomies for women are the equivalent of cardiac bypasses for men. Women don't have so many heart problems, but we do have uteruses. And so the private sector goes to town with cardiac bypasses for men and uh, hysterectomies for women. And that's what you get when you don't have this balance working, uh, working right. And I would hope that this Lancet Commission can really work towards spelling out what it would mean to get that balance right. Thank you. Professor Sen, it's so tempting to carry on this conversation about the path to UHC that we've been down in the last decade, uh, especially the financialization and privatization route without any accountability frameworks and overarching principles. But uh, we'll have to have that conversation some other time. Um, moving on to Vivek, your comments to the question very briefly. Sure. Yes, I because I noticed we have very few minutes left. So let me uh, actually echo both the previous responses. Uh, Dr. Puras talked about HIV. I think, uh, you know, the problem has been that we have lived in our little bubbles of, in the HIV world and we've not shown the world what is possible pragmatically in working to actually have a better health response. Uh, I'll give you one uh, quick example. And I, I should also say that the rest of the world has not been willing to look at HIV as a model as much, uh, has, has seen the exceptionalism and has been pushed away by it. I think what we, so a, a simple example of the, the pragmatics of how to deliver health. Uh, 20, 25 years ago, one sat with the bureaucracy in the city of Bombay. And actually one of us was gay, the other was a sex worker, the other was a person who used to use drugs, another was an HIV positive person. And we sat with a bureaucrat in the Maharashtra government or the Bombay city government. And we actually explained our contexts. And those bureaucrats' eyes opened up. They didn't open up immediately, but they opened up over time. And they understood the challenges of our inability to access, forget about healthcare, just basic fundamental stuff uh, as, as, as just occupants of the city. And thereby, dots were connected on what are the other pragmatic ways in which these communities can actually be better served so that their health is protected and the health of larger communities protected. And you saw a change over time. This is painstaking work. This is not work which is necessarily written in policy or law, but this is the kind of work that needs to happen. And this, according to me, is what rights-based approaches also include. I should definitely want to also say that I'm so glad that Dr. Sen spoke about the rights-based approaches not equaling legal approaches. It's quite a different thing. But I also want to say that if you want to reign in the private sector or certainly govern it, you need a legal framework. You have to have a framework which makes it accountable and discrimination and equality is one of those things that offers a legal framework. So it has to be married with other pragmatic things. It can't be by itself, but certainly the law is not a solution uh, to the problem. There is, it, it's gotta be a combination of things. There's a lot more I can say, I would love to carry it on. And I think I, I'm gonna, connect with Dr. Sen and Dr. Puras also, and Meera, of course, later, to see how we can carry this conversation on. Thanks. Thanks, Vivek. Yes, um, uh, actually, the HLEG report um, has quite a substantive chapter on the regulation and accountability mechanisms for the private sector and can be very instructive uh, in this work moving forward. But now I ask Meera for her final... Which I talk. was responsible for, by the way. Yes, yes, Dr. Sandy, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I think Dr. Sen has responded very well to the question. And but just to add, when we speak of equality, I think we also speak in terms of with an understanding of equity and not just equality. So it's important to, again, center stage that notion of what we really mean. And uh, of course, yeah, the private sector is here to stay, uh, despite you know many of our approaches towards what the private sector has really done to uh, uh, public health at a broader uh, level. But it is therefore all the more important to, to rein in the private sector and to have these mechanisms of accountability 
Uh, we definitely have had some examples previously, but there are things that have worked, not worked. For instance, the, uh, the Consumer Protection Act in some ways uh, was a measure to, to hold the private sector accountable, but it is again, I mean, there are huge limitations of the act, the way it is actually uh, implemented, etc. So I think one also needs to revisit as part of these uh, uh, frameworks, revisit uh, what kinds of uh, accountability uh, mechanisms have not worked or how is it that the private sector actually finds ways through you know, all the uh, holes in the law and then uh, uh, you know, with their huge cloud. So it's, I think, also important to look at that. Uh, but I entirely agree with Dr. Sain that there needs to be this pressure as well because yeah, the public sector uh, can be very difficult. So it's important to also hold the public sector actually accountable. So how does one do that also needs to be part of our uh, uh, discourse. Yeah. Okay. That was great. I mean, it's really, it's hard to end the conversation here, but we have to, and I'm sure we'll carry on this conversation outside of the webinar. Um, but thank you to all the panelists. I now hand over to Yamini for her concluding remarks. I knew when we were going to, uh, when we were conceptualizing this uh, discussion that it would be one of the most powerful contributions into shaping our thinking. Uh, and of course, uh, all none of you disappointed. This is such a uh, important uh, engagement for us to have as we think about uh, what are the policy implications of, of universal health coverage, the import, the dynamics of power, um, how we need to think about how they. Uh, how they shape uh, the patient's experiences with the public health system from the minute they walk in, uh, actually from the moment they engage with the community health worker to when they go to the primary health center and all the way up. And it's in that context then that we can have a discourse around the hierarchies, the structures, the legal frameworks, the regulatory environment. Um, and I think uh, no matter how nuts and bolts and policy we get in terms of what needs to be done uh, to to make the promise of universal healthcare reality. If we don't anchor this in this understanding, then we may fall into the trap of uh, really giving the wrong recommendations. And I think the, the, um, the important uh, caution that was given to us uh, through this conversation that debating universal healthcare without anchoring it in the foundations of a right to health may end up uh, creating a deepening of inequalities um, and inequities, which is precisely I see what a discourse on universal health care is seeking to avoid uh, is something that we need to recognize much, much more seriously. I think also importantly, this the, the discussion around state capacity uh, is uh, and, and rights is an important one. Um, and in fact, in one of my early conversations with Vivek, I had sort of we, we were discussing the experiences of rights frameworks and other social policies and what impact that has had on the actual ability for creating a governance architecture that realizes those rights. Um, but uh, I think it's a it's a discussion that needs to continue. But again, one that where we shouldn't throw the baby out of the bathwater. The lack of state capacity is not a reason why we shouldn't be debating uh, you know, a, a rights framework. In fact, the argument should be what kind of state capacity do you need to enable in order for universal coverage to, to actually become a reality. And therefore, in some ways, where you're pushing us through this conversation is to really uh, get to the heart of the normative role of the state vis-a-vis -vis health articulating that effectively and building from there uh, what this architecture of a universal health system should look like and the relationship between the state, uh, the private uh, sector, and of course, keeping the patient or the citizen at the heart of it. So thank you very, very much. I hope that we can trouble you um, over the course of the next few months as our own deliberations uh, emerge and evolve. Uh, and I hope that, uh, you know, I, I think it'll mean a lot for us to refine our ideas through a dialogue with all of you. So thank you. Thanks very much, Stay Help, for organizing this. This is really one of the most important conversations we've had.